Okay, so we're back. Um, uh, we're doing the uh, 5150 replica here. Uh, where we last left off, we had just finished doing the, uh, the belly cut for the guitar. That's all done. We did some edge sanding uh, to get that all ready. Um, we have not yet sanded the top yet or the back side of the guitar. That'll come next. Um, but what I wanted to do right now was uh, we were talking about getting the guitar ready for playing to make sure that it was um, workable as a guitar, that all the pieces were going to fit together correctly, um, and that nothing was going to be too wonky and that there wouldn't have to be further woodworking to accommodate some anomaly. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to um, start putting this thing together. So like I said, I have a neck already that uh, I had done a while ago um, to the, you know, Kramer banana sort of like shape. Um, I can tell it's got a little bit of playing time on it, um, a little bit of relicking done, not quite to where I want it yet. Um, and I can tell you a little bit about the construction of it. Uh, it's originally, I do build necks, but this one I didn't really build. It's sort of a modified deal. Uh, I started off with, a, with an all parts, um, 22 fret paddle head neck. Um, it has all the features that you would want from a Kramer neck. I mean, I have some original beak necks and other necks. And in fact, I bought, I was able to actually buy necks from Kramer in like 85 and 86 without bodies, which no other company I think in history would ever do. So they sent me actually untouched necks, no holes drilled in them. And I was built a few guitars for myself that way. But anyway, this is like the closest thing I could find to what would be like a Kramer era construction. It has the, the skunk stripe, uh, the vintage style truss rod, um, the basically the, the area, the transition from where the, uh, where the nut would be um, to this sort of like upward move on the all parts neck allows for the sort of correct look. If you've got a, if you take a close look at Eddie's guitar, it looks like this line here actually extends into the, into the nut. A lot of guitars, they have sort of like the banana starts a little bit further out and you get this extended sort of um, profile from the neck going out. And that's not really what his looked like. So um, the paddle head, I thought had the best chance of kind of being turned into a authentic beak and all you really had to do was add wood here. Um, the paddle head was not quite wide enough to fit this part. So I, there is a um, an extension or a piece, of sh another piece of, uh, of maple glued on right around here someplace to complete it. Um, it's already drilled out for the uh, Floyd Rose R2 nut for the shelf and all that. Um, the other thing I did was I've got a uh, an Ernie Ball Music Man guitar an Ed model and the other thing I liked about the paddle head neck from all parts was how big it was. It was a very large, um, well, not very large. It wasn't like a boat neck or like a one inch thick, but it was bigger than what you needed. Um, so I was able to basically work this guitar down, work this neck down asymmetrically to sort of copy that Ernie Ball neck. And uh, just like the original, the E strings, have a tendency if you're not used to playing it for falling off the edges there. So it's it's very narrow up here. Um, it's sort of round, but not very fat. Um, and it's rounder on this side, on the on the base side, and sort of a little bit flatter on the treble side. It's a, so it kind of when your hands on it, this part of your thumb it feels comfortable. It's nice and round to ride under, but on the bottom side of the neck there's not a whole lot of stuff getting in the way for your fingers to kind of come all the way across. And it's really a very comfortable neck to play, especially for someone that doesn't have enormous hands. I do not have enormous hands. I mean, I think Ed had, he has pretty big hands. I've shook his hand a couple of times and it, it, you know, he's got big hands. There's no question about that. And that's probably why he's able to do a lot of what he's able to do. But this is pretty close to that neck. Got jumbo frets on it already. And we did use some aged lacquer and, and so forth to get kind of that, that wear pattern. We're gonna kind of accentuate that more when we put it together. But what we wanna do right now is we wanna um, put the neck in and determine how it's relating to the position of the cavities. So 
Um, first, we're just going to go ahead and press it in. Okay, and that was a that was a function of basically, um, you know, determining um, how wide the neck was beforehand uh, that we wanted to use, and then creating the pocket to be the right size. Um, and I did a little bit of the work because we're probably going to have to do a little bit more. I've done a little bit of the work freehand, freehand um, before talking to you guys here or showing you with one of these. It's just a sheet of plexi of uh, polycarbonate, quarter inch with some sandpaper on it. And basically, I take it and I place it in the pocket here and I kind of sand away what needs to be sanded away. Because originally, the pocket is undersized. So I really want to get the guitar to be really solidly put together without any chance for the neck to kind of, you know, move side to side. Um, the pocket should fit the neck snug. Now, you don't want it so snug that you got to really squish it in. Um, that doesn't allow for expansion and contraction, being that we have two different woods. We've got, you know, poplar and maple, and they're going to expand and contract at different rates. And if one is to expand or contract faster than the other, it can conceivably crack um, the pocket. And you see that a lot in guitars. Um, so you want a balance. You want it so it's it can move a little bit, but not so much that you end up with a sloppy sort of um, a sloppy fit. So we'll use some sandpaper. I've also got a very sharp chisel here. Um, this I sharpened to, you know, with 1200 grit sandpaper up to that point, you could definitely shave with this. And that you could just sort of work along there to take out any extra shavings that you want to do for at first. Um, we had to remove almost a, uh, I would say it was somewhere around, oh, maybe a, a 30 second of wood to get the neck to even go in. So a lot of that was done with the chisel, very carefully kind of cutting um, and then cleaning up with the sandpaper. So anyway, what we're going to do is determine all this stuff, where how it's all lining up. So we put the neck back in, get it seated firmly. Now we're going to figure out where this neck center line is in relation to the body. So to do that, um, what we've got here is our ruler. Okay, and we're going to get a pencil. Um, I like to use mechanical pencils. They're the ones that have the lead that you kind of drop in. Um, you always get a consistent line. Um, it, you know, it's very fine and you don't have to keep sharpening. Um, something that, you know, I've always used mechanical pencils. I think they're much better. But what you want to do is you're going to take your straight edge or ruler and you're going to place it up against the edge of the neck. Okay. And kind of make sure it's up against the neck. Right. And then you're going to hold down the ruler with your other hand and you're going to draw your line here between the trim cavity, okay, and the humbucking pocket, humbucker pocket, okay, and that's going to represent one side. Now you're going to do it to the other side as well. You're going to take your ruler, you're going to place it up against the neck, um, make sure you got it in a good spot, that it's riding up against the edge, hold it in place, take your mechanical pencil again and draw yourself with your line. Now that is basically how your neck is running in relation to the body. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a ruler. I like to use these steel rulers with uh, fine increments. And what I do is I find the center of these, of these two lines. Okay, so basically I do that by lining up a number where I think is approximately the middle. Okay, and then I look at either side of the number. So we've got, we've lined up the middle is going to be on what's the three inch here. And I've got a two inch and a four inch. And I basically move the ruler around until I get the same distance between this two inch backwards to this four inch backwards. So we're just under a quarter. And I get those two kind of centered up. Just one thirty second under a quarter inch from each side. And that determines our exact center line. So right there is where your center line is. All right. Now we can also kind of see, well, how does that relate to the humbucker cavity? Like, um, I don't know that Kramer actually did this. I don't think they did because most of the, the some of the guitars I've got, the strings kind of hang off the fretboard a little bit in relation to, um, you know, where they should be. They're always, they always seem to be biased too towards the treble side. Like, the strings are leaning towards this side. So you could fall off here, but there's plenty of room over here. 
it always seems to be that many guitars seem to suffer from that problem. But if you do this, when you're going to locate your bridge, which is what we're trying to do right now, um, and then make sure that it's in a good spot where you can actually get your humbucker to sit, uh, you know, in between the two E's without, you know, having, you know, it biased to one side or the other side too greatly, you'll find that the humbucker will sound better. And also, obviously, the guitar will play much better if, if the strings are somewhere on the fretboard and not falling off the edge. And when you're using a very thin neck in terms of this dimension here, it's even more important that you get this right. Um, because there really isn't a lot of more room for error. Um, so what we're going to do also here is we're going to determine where our um, center of the pick pickup cavity is. And we're going to do it the same way. Basically, I'm going to do at, at six and a half, I'm going to consider center. Um, or let's do seven. Let's do it that way. So we're going to line up seven, the seven inch marker right here, or any marker really, to our center line that we've created by checking the neck. And we're going to move it back slightly and we're going to see how is it in relation to the sunbarker. Well, we can see right now that actually the cavity, this neck, is once again biased in that same way. That there is actually the, um, there's more room on one side and the other. In this case, we're talking about we only really have to adjust the neck to move maybe a, a 32nd of an inch to get it perfectly in line with this, uh, with this cavity. Um, so there's not going to be a whole lot to do um, at all. In fact, you know what? I probably won't even mess with this. I mean, it's really within the margin of error almost, to my eye. It looks like we're already pretty much right in the middle there. Um, so I think what we've got is our, uh, our neck's in a good spot. Um, it's still a little tiny bit tight, so I'm going to show you um, what we want to do there is basically take our, our paper, right? And uh, I should say, if you want your neck to go more this way, you take out material here and here. If you need it to go this way, you take out a little bit more material here and here. I mean, that's pretty self-explanatory. But we're going to go ahead and just remove a little bit more material here. Just to create a little bit of a, a relief there for the neck to do a little bit of expansion and contraction. And the other thing I like to do at this point is to ease the edges here, which really facilitate not only um, the neck coming in and out of the pocket easier, but also when you're finishing the guitar, when you're painting it, um, any real sharp edges tend not to take paint very well, and they'll wear through very quickly. So a little bit of an easing of the edge is a good idea all the way around the pocket. Um, it also will help discourage any chipping um, because there's really no sharp edge for a chip to start on. Um, so we got a little bit of easing going there. Uh, I'm going to take off some of this paper here to do this and kind of ease the edge here as well. Now I should also tell you we're going to put in a little divot here as well for the truss rod adjustment and that neck is a heel adjust. Because that's Ed's guitar head that all the Kramers had that little sort of uh, adjustment thing there. And to do that, what I like to use is just what's called a rat tail file. And it's just a round file. Um, and you just find the center of the cavity and just kind of sand away. If you don't want to spend money on a file, uh, you could just get anything like a pen. A pen will work. Um, for instance, um, you might take something like a big pen. Right, and you might take a piece of sandpaper and wrap it around the big pen like that. And now you have sort of a file and you can kind of guesstimate where that's at and go ahead and you can see it's already started. You can make yourself your little truss rod access um, sort of notch there. I don't know if you can get an idea of what that looks like, but you know, it's not very difficult to create. So we'll be doing that um, also in the final sanding. Um, and uh, so I think it's a good spot to leave right now. Um, we've determined where the center is. It looks good to the pickup. Um, I have a vintage Floyd Rose from the 80s coming, which was off a Kramer guitar. Um, and when I get that in, I'm going to go ahead and show you how you would install a Floyd Rose in terms of locating the posts, drilling the posts, the type of bits that you want to use, the depths, 
all that kind of stuff. So that should be pretty cool. So that should be here in a couple of days. Um, maybe we'll do some more finish sanding, maybe put that in, put that little notch in while we're wasting time waiting for the part. Um, but it looks like we've got ourselves a, a guitar that is on its way to being playable. So I think we'll just leave it here today and uh, we'll see you later.